Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everybody. My name is Mark Canavera. I am the Associate Director of the Care and Protection of Children, or CPC Learning Network, whose secretariat is housed at Columbia University. And we are very excited to host this webinar uh, today in collaboration with the Initiative on Child Rights in the Global Compact on Refugees and the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. Uh, this webinar, which we do hope will be very interactive, grew out of September's high-level summit for refugees and migrants, uh, at which the UN General Assembly adopted the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants, setting an ambitious agenda around protecting and sharing responsibility for refugees and migrants globally. Uh, over the next 18 months, and we're already into the process, uh, the international community will be called upon and supporting the translation of these commitments into practice uh, through the development of uh, global compacts, one on refugees and the other on safe, orderly, and regular migration. And we being child-focused people here, um, uh, there have been a group of people who are especially interested in how this work will be uh, will include and involve and um, promote children's rights. Uh, we have an all-star lineup of people to talk to you about this initiative today and are also seeking your feedback. This webinar is the first in a two-part series. In this first one, we are sharing the initiative and uh, seeking your feedback on it. And in the Next one, we will be kind of presenting some work that has been done to look at the different ways that the Global Compacts can incorporate children um, and, and seeking feedback at that stage as well. We're tentatively aiming for May. Everybody who has participated in this webinar or registered for it will automatically get an invitation to that second one as well once the date and time have been uh, firmed up. Uh, today, we'll be hearing from a number of people. Uh, the first two who are the uh, co-coordinators of the Initiative on Child Rights and the Global Compact on Refugees and the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. They are Daniela Reale, who is the lead on child protection and children on the move at Save the Children UK, and Ignacio Packer, who is the Secretary General of the Terre des Hommes International Federation. After they've presented the initiative, we will also hear from Michelle Klein-Solomon, the Director of Migration Policy and Research uh, at the International Organization of Mi on Migration, and Ellen Hansen, Senior Policy Advisor in the Assistant High Commissioner's Office, who is working on the global compacts that we are discussing today at UNHCR, or the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, uh, one very quick uh, note, it is that we will be running a number of polls throughout the webinar, and we are going to launch the first one now. Uh, your screen should switch to this. Um, what is your main interest in joining the webinar today? You have five options there. Uh, one is that you are following the Global Compact on Refugees. The other is that you're following the Global Compact on Migration. Third is that you're following both. Fourth is an interest in advocacy on um, migrants and children on the move issues. And five is other. I'll give you just a few uh, minutes, not minutes, maybe even 20 or 30 seconds to make sure that everybody has a chance to vote. We've only got 31% voting so far. Could we get a few more votes before we close the poll? And then we will hand it over to uh, Daniela and Ignacio. Let's see, we're at a 36% vote rate. Not great yet. Couple more seconds. All right. Um, we have quite a few of you who have voted now, so I'm going to go ahead and um, close that poll in five, four, three, two, one. Closed. It looks like um, we generally we have interest in advocacy writ large. I'm not sure if it is. Uh, 
showing you the results here, I hope so. 58% uh, have an interest in um, advocacy, um, and 19% follow blo both global compacts. Um, and uh, then smaller percentages who follow one or the other. Um, and then finally, um, if you have questions or would like to make a comment, please keep an eye on both the question and chat boxes, which you can use, um, and we will be monitoring those to bring those to the presenters. Uh, with no further ado, I will pass the microphone to Daniela Reale, the um, lead on child protection and children on the move at Save the Children UK. Yes, thank you, Mark. I really appreciate um, your introduction. And uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone on this uh, webinar today. So what um, I will do, I'll give you a little bit of a background uh, on the initiative that um, Save the Children and the Soma co-convening, co um, which is called Initiative on Child Rights and the Global Compacts, um, and then uh, pass the microphone to um, Ignacio from Terezom, who will talk to you about some elements of this, um, of the initiative that we are are um, working together on. Um, the initiative on child rights and the global compacts was launched um, at the end of last year. Um, and it was um, kind of its origin comes from um, the work that we did in the lead up and during the negotiations to that led to the New York Declaration. And so a few child-focused organizations came together to um, discuss how we could ensure that uh, the follow-up to the New York Declaration, which, as you probably know, um, is going to take us to the, um, uh, to the negotiation and definition of uh, the two global compacts that uh, um, Michelle and Ella will talk to us about a little bit more in detail. Um, that these two global compacts would have a very um, will be very focused on uh, on children and children are the very core, a very heart of uh, um, of these very important um, agreements that will define how, how um, large migration flows will be uh, managed and people protected as part of that. So um, what we did, we brought together a number of uh, organizations that had been active during the New York Declaration, Declaration negotiations, and we discussed how we could work together um, to define what a child focus agenda would look like um, and could be reflected in those two compacts. So um, we um, the, the goal of this initiative is very much um, around um, ensuring that um, a coherent, harmonized, child-focused goals, uh, but even targets and potential indicators, um, for example, in line with uh, the 2030 agenda, could very much be reflected in the um, in the compact. The initiative has uh, um, 19 organisations um, members. Um, you will see the list in one of the um, one of the um, documents that are posted in this um, as part of this webinar. But just to give you a sense of how uh, of who's involved, obviously. Um, our co-presenters today, IOM and USD, are, are very active members of our steering committee. So and so are um, UNICEF, um, Norwegian Refugee Council, for example, uh, ICMC, ICFA, um, OHCHR, um, the International Detention Coalition, um, PICOM. Um, uh, World Vision, but also um, individual experts like special rapporteurs on violence and the rights of migrants and so on and so forth. There are three uh, pillars um, for um, within this initiative. One um, looks at developing a report um, that is being worked by two um, very uh, expert consultants, Mike Dottridge and Jackie Baba. Um, of, and uh, Ignacio will tell you a bit more about that. Um, another key pillar of this initiative is the uh, Global Conference on Children on the Move. 
and thirdly um, will be some form of um, collective uh, um, influencing kind of initiative and plan that will follow um, the, the, the conference and will in a way bring together all these agencies. I will now leave the floor to Ignacio who will talk to you through uh, the, um, the work that we're doing around um, the report. Thank you, Daniela, and good morning, good afternoon, or whatever, wherever you are. So, what do we want for children? What do we want for children in the global compact? And I think Daniela really um, uh, uh, put the key words, it's a coherent and harmonized, child-focused, but expressed in terms of focused goals, targets, indicators, and we want it in line with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and working on a what would hopefully be an appropriate timeline for their implementation. Um, this uh, would be reflected in a, a working document, so this is one of the pillars, one of the three pillars of the initiative, a working document that would be made available on the 22nd of June. To be made available then to uh, for the consultations around the um, the global compacts, the stock keeping, and then the negotiations leading to um, uh, uh, the fall of 2018. What is there in this working document and what is the reasoning behind focusing on goals, targets and indicators and how uh, does this ambition match with what is possible? Well, we, we're drawing here on states commitments to comply with the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And so the initiative aims at ensuring that both global compacts ref reflect a common approach to protecting children on the move. And beyond refugee and migrant children, also serving also for other uh, uh, children, including the, uh, um, the uh, internally displaced uh, children. Agreeing on a new global compact on refugees uh, is already pretty challenging, and UNHCR will tell us a bit more about it in a, in a moment. Um, and while the issue of um, refugee protection has a normative framework, um, and including the 1951 um, Refugee Convention, the issues um, UN member states will have to address on uh, in in the migration compact, compact is really complex, but uh, I certainly strongly believe as achievable, and um, reaching an agreement in the Global Compact on Migration is surely going to require skill, patience, and compromise, and it's great to have Michelle from IOM with us, because she's going to tell us more about these skills and patience that she certainly has. Um, as for children, member states have to take commitments and renew these commitments that are already framed in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and on the basis a child is a child, no matter its migration uh, status. So what I would like to cover really rapidly in a, in a couple of minutes now is around the binding or non-binding issue of the global um, compacts. What we're trying here with the initiative is to try and come up rapidly with an example also of um, something concrete on which the global compacts could could be inspired, build on. So it goes also beyond advocating for what we find, what is, what we want in the global compacts for children, is also bringing it as early as we can in the um, consultation process, also to show that it is realistic to work on, uh, on goals, targets, and uh, indicators. Now, binding or non-binding is, of course, a central issue on the global uh, compacts. And uh, how the global compacts bind any of its signatories to commitments and, and to deliverables is, is unlike the, the New York Declaration, which is not clearly uh, binding. And we have to keep in mind that member states have already taken commitments, and there is a concern, of course, around regression on human rights on pre-existing commitments. So there are four possibilities, 
perhaps there are more, but we've looked at four possibilities around this issue of binding or non-binding. One is the global uh, compacts could um, follow the way of declaration and become a political statement that lays out uh, guidelines for nations that they can use or not use. That's not what we want, waste of energy and resources. The second possibility, to produce a binding document that's under international law, would require signatures to adhere and so on, ideal but unlikely. So the third outcome could be that member states uh, bind to some parts of the agreement, but not to others, such as the, the Paris Climate Accords. But the big risk that we see here is that the parts of the agreement which would require the most resources or action would then fall into the non-binding category. So this initiative is really building and pushing on this fourth option, which is the, the one that uh, states, states should reach consensus and, um, and advance the global protection regime, and specifically uh, uh, for children, but with an option that sets out specific targets, and both for, uh, for uh, nations and the global community uh, to meet with, uh, with a certain time. This is certainly the, the first pillar of the initiative on child rights in the global compacts, um, the elaboration of this working document. It's entitled Child Rights in the Global Compacts, Goals, Targets, Indicators. And we have mandated, as uh, Daniela said, Jackie Babab and Mike Doddridge, but with a group of uh, approximately 12 um, experts from different agencies who are um, uh, working, uh, working on this. Uh, exciting, exciting moments and uh, challenging moments. And I, I hand over uh, for, the, uh, for you, Daniela, to, work, to present the second pillar of the initiative. Yes, thanks, Ignacio. Um, um, so, in terms of the second pillar of this initiative, as uh, we were mentioning before, we are um, very excited to be organizing a follow-up to what was the first global conference on uh, children on the move which was held back in 2010 in Barcelona. This conference that we'll be organizing and will take place in June, um, 12th and 13th of June in Berlin, um, will be in a way a follow-up to that but uh, more importantly will be as we're saying a very integral part of uh, our initiative looking at how we're going to ensure that um, um, we build a constituency of um, if the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Sorry, I just received a, um, a message from from Mark. Is it is everything okay? Can people hear? Okay, <clears throat> excellent. It seems that um, um, some of the issues, technical issues that we were having have been solved. Um, so, um, sorry, I was mentioning that uh, this, this conference will very much be um, um, co creating a constituency of, uh, of actors so, uh, that will uh, um, hopefully take action to ensure that children's rights are at the very center of the processes that uh, will take place in the next few months, um, um, in the next year or so, looking at the two global compacts, but not only. We are uh, um, inviting a full range of stakeholders uh, look, um, from um, UN agencies to civil society to private sectors to state representatives uh, with the aim of uh, focusing on, on uh, collective action, on uh, um, ensuring that uh, um, we very much discuss five key principles um, uh, around best interest of the child, around non-discrimination, around um, ensuring access, uh, equitable access to services for all children on the move, um, around the ending of uh, uh, child immigration detention and ensuring that alternatives and appropriate care are put in place, and around um, integration 
and, and of discrimination. We'll be discussing this through um, over two days um, uh, where we'll have um, um, panel discussions but also very technical uh, and more ad hoc um, sessions. Um, from um, and obviously the, the report that uh, Ignacio was mentioning um, and that um, uh, will be um, at its final stages by then will be very much um, a basis for our conversations in Berlin in June. Um, a very obviously busy month because as you know um, we'll, we'll have had um, quite a lot of, uh, of events um, and foc which will focus on migration from the G7 at the international level to the G20 going looking forward and the Global Forum on Migration and Development. So we think that this conference will, um, will contribute quite strongly uh, to um, a month of, uh, of very um, important debates that so will look at uh, migration as well. Um, just uh, a reference as well to the fact that we are looking at um, um, quite strong element of child participation or youth participation at the conference, the same as we did back in uh, 2010 in Barcelona, um, with um, um, a consultation with uh, young people and their uh, active participation during the event. And I think I'll stop here and I'll, um, I'll give the... Um, the floor to you, Mark, to introduce our next speakers. Uh, before I do that, Daniela, and I did want to apologize to the room, what has happened is that our uh, webinar participant limit was reached. We had understood it was a thousand people and it turns out to be 101. So we're talking to uh, GoToWebinar customer service right now, but this has meant that many of your colleagues are getting um, messages about not being able to participate. To, um, Rest assured that the recording will be available and we will also make sure that we increase that limit before the next uh, webinar. Um, and uh, I believe that there is another poll that we were going to run at this point um, about the five focus issues, Daniela. Is, that, is this the right moment? Yes, and maybe we could also ask um, our colleagues in the room um, their views around um, the conference itself. I think there is a specific question focusing on that. Okay, so we will, um, do we do both polls right now or the sure. focus issues? All right, we're going to launch two polls for the audience. Um, this first one is, um, asking you about the five focus issues uh, of the initiative and which one that you as participants um, believe are should be the focal one. So take a few seconds um, Of the five focus issues of the initiative uh, for child rights and the global compacts, so which is your top priority or which do you think should be a top priority on children in the compacts? And the, um, the five issues are there. I do sincerely apologize. We keep getting messages that the, the limit has been reached. For, so I know that some people are kind of in and out of the webinar, but we hope that those who are in now will be in uh, for the remainder. Um, so, has everyone had a chance to answer this one? We've still got a few people answering. <laughs> it is looking like um, there is no majority for a single one, but uh, with nearly 70% of you voting, 40, oh, 72%, it looks like the um, best interest of the child as a top priority is is going to be the leader of the plurality there. Um, I'm going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, one, and uh, you should be able to see the results briefly there. 43% um, of you voted for the best interest of the child and 26% uh, voted for durable solutions. 
And we will ask one more question before we hand over to our next speakers, um, which is, um, what, I'm launching here. Um, I hope you can all see this now. What would be the most important achievement of the Global Conference on Children in the Move on June 12th and 13th? And there are a few issues there for you. Um, identifying key issues for inclusion in the Global Compacts, creating a constituency to advocate for child rights in the context of large and complex migratory flows, uh, exchanging goods and practices, or exchanging good practices, sorry, or other. Um, and just maybe 30 more seconds. We've got a good participation rate at this point. Over 50% have voted, so over 60%. You're just clicking away. Nearly 70% have voted, 70%. So I am going to um, close this poll in five, four, three, two, one, and 78% of you voted, um, so quite a large number of you thought that either creating a constituency to advocate for child rights in the complex in the context of large and complex migratory flows, uh, and a nearly equal number for those who thought that identifying key issues to include in the global compacts. Uh, would be important. So thank you for those thoughts, and that's one small way that we can uh, foster audience participation. Please also do use the questions box, uh, which we see below. And um, with no further ado, I am going to turn the microphone over to um, Michelle Klein-Solomon, who is the Director of the Migration Policy and Research Department at the International Organization for Migration. Uh, Michelle will be followed by Ellen Hansen, Senior Policy Advisor in the Assistant High Commissioner's Office at the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, who is also working on both of the global compacts that we've been discussing today. Um, Michelle and then Ellen, over to you. Thank you very much, Mark, Daniela, and Ignacio, and great to, to have so many of you on the line. Thank you so much for the chance to be able to speak with you today. So I'm, I do have a new title. I, I should have let you know I'm now Senior Policy Advisor to the Director General, but it doesn't really change the nature of the function. Um, let me talk about the Global Compact on Migration. And as Ignacio said, and I fully sh endorse everything he said so far, that in many respects, the Global Compact on Migration is more complicated because of the lack of a centralized, unifying, normative framework and governance mechanisms. But I also completely agree with his judgment that it's achievable. And, and more than it being achievable, it must be achieved. And this is an, uh, a remarkable opportunity in the area of migration, in many respects, couldn't come at a worse time um, given global political changes and resurgence of nationalism and populism in so many countries in the world. But it is the moment that we have, and we have to make the best of it. So uh, let me you know, offer that note of encouragement and a real call to action to engage here. I'm going to start by speaking a bit about the process for the Global Compact on Migration because it's, it's fairly complicated and I'll try to be straightforward and of course happy to take questions afterwards. I'll start with the process, then a bit about the players, and then a little bit more about IOM and specifically the opportunities to intervene and ensure that child's rights and protection become actionable commitments in the Global Compact on Migration. So the process. The way it's laid out is there will be three phases between now and what is likely to be September 2018 when it is hoped that the Global Compact on Migration will be adopted by member states at the highest levels. The three phases um, start on the 1st of April, although in a sense they've already begun the first one between now and the end of November, which is effectively the consultations phase. I'll come back to that and go into more depth about that. The second phase will be from November to February 2017 to 2018, which is effectively the stock-taking phase. 
And then the third phase will be the negotiation phase from February 2018 through, it's expected to last certainly until the end of July 2018, and on into the actual uh, um, consideration of the Global Compact on Migration for Adoption probably in September 2018. Let me focus on the first phase because in many respects that's the most important one, uh, the consultations phase, because that is the chance to get issues on the table, to formulate ideas, to formulate recommendations, and to ensure that all the issues are canvassed, all the voices are heard, and that we get a balanced um, set of, of input that can be taken into account in the later phases. So that consultation phase um, has three principal components. The first is a thematic one. And if you look at the, what's called the modalities resolution um, that was developed after the New York Declaration was passed, it was agreed at the end of January. Formally, it's not actually been adopted by the General Assembly yet. Uh, it's held up for budgetary reasons, but the, the, the substance is there, um, con came to a conclusion at the end of January. It calls for six thematic consultations. Um, all three of them will be here in Geneva, two in New York, and one in Vienna. And they will start with the first one, which is on human rights, social inclusion, cohesion, discrimination, including racism, xenophobia, and intolerance, which will be in Geneva May 8th through 9th. The one following that will be in New York um, toward the end of May, looking at the drivers of migration, including ch climate change, natural, and human-made crises as well as protection and assistance. Third, we'll come back to Geneva in June on international cooperation and governance in, of migration in all its dimensions. Fourth, in July in New York on contributions of migrants and diasporas to development. Fifth is to be in Vienna, a date is not yet set, on smuggling and trafficking. And sixth, we'll be back in Geneva probably the first week of October, on irregular migration and regular pathways, including decent work, labor mobility, recognition of skills and qualifications. You will note that the word child doesn't appear in any of those. Notwithstanding that, um, I would like to make the case that children should be factored into nearly all of them, if not all of them. And it would be very important to look at, in each of those thematic consultations, what, what are the objectives with respect to children and how to ensure that they're adequately taken into account in what's being framed? The second part of the consultative phase is a series of regional consultations that the UN Regional Economic Commissions, all five in, in the five major regions of the world, will be organizing together with IOM and other agencies and with governments from the region. And while the precise um, themes of the, those consultations are not yet determined, they will be framed along what's of particular interest to the governments of those regions and to other stakeholders in the regions. And you can fairly well expect that they will pick up the same six broad themes um, that I mentioned above and others that are of particular interest to regions. And the third major um, element of the consultative phase is a series of what are called multi-stakeholder hearings. There are to be four days of multi-stakeholder hearings, some in New York, at least one in Geneva, and we're not sure yet. We don't know exactly the dates, um, but those will be opportunities to canvas the views and hear the perspectives of civil society organizations, academia, diaspora, migrant organizations, actually migrants' voices, a whole host of other state business sector, other stakeholders. And those will be important um, avenues for, um, uh, for getting views heard. Those are the formal processes that are envisioned. There's also reference to other activities and other kinds of um, consultations that may take place or views that may be de developed by other stakeholders. Again, the intention in this phase is to be open, inclusive, comprehensive. And this is really where I would encourage the initiative to focus its activities. I'll come back to some of the other venues in, in a moment. I want to spend a minute on the players so that you understand the structure of how the Global Compact on Migration is being managed, because it's quite different from the Global Compact on Refugees. There are a multitude of stakeholders. They all matter in, in the leadership, and, it's, you know, and the lines are not entirely clear. It's, an, it's a process that's evolving. In the first instance, um, the Global Compact is meant to be 
um, developed through intergovernmental negotiations, which means member states. So it's primarily, in the end of the day, going to be determined by member states. But as I said before, the, certainly at a minimum the consultative phase, but yes as well some of the other phases, um, the views of other stakeholders absolutely must be taken into account. The way the member states' views will get represented is um, largely through the delegations in New York, but with specific points of, um, of focus and energy. The Office of the President of the General Assembly will technically hold each of those, uh, host each of those thematic consultations that I mentioned. They will also host the multi-stakeholder hearings I mentioned. There will be two co-facilitators, governmental representatives appointed by the President of the General Assembly to lead the, the process overall, and specifically that final phase of intergovernmental negotiations between February and uh, the end of the summer in 2018. There were two co-facilitators appointed to develop the modalities resolution, the permanent representatives of Mexico and Switzerland and New York. And um, while there, they have not yet been reappointed for uh, with a look forward, the expectation is that they are likely to be reappointed for the duration of the process. So those will be important players and conveners, and they will to help facilitate the, the negotiations. Mexico is also hosting the stock taking the, that I mentioned, the second phase, which will be a stock taking meeting in November in uh, Mexico. And there will also be a, a report of the Secretary General produced at that point with um, analysis, including facts and figures, and recommendations about how to move forward. Those two major inputs during the stocking taking phase will then feed into the third phase, which is where the co-facilitators develop a first draft of the Global Compact on Migration um, by the beginning of February and then present that for negotiations. So those are important poles of influence. You will all probably be aware that the Secretary General has appointed a new special representative of the Secretary General on international migration, Louise Arbor, former High Commissioner for Human Rights, and uh, by all accounts, a superb rights advocate and a very effective um, global diplomat and somebody that I know we at IOM have enormous confidence to help lead the process. And IOM is given um, a particularly important role in the process, partly as IOM entered the UN system in, in connection with the September summit and is expected to play a leadership role in servicing the whole process, including by providing the needed technical and policy expertise, not to the exclusion of other actors, of course, and including our, our partners in the UN system in the Global Migration Group, but others, but with the, clearly with an, a leadership role. And just so you know, we've seconded to two people to the Office of the Special Representative, the Secretary General, to work with her through the duration. Um, so that's a bit about, about the players. Obviously, the Global Migration Group will have um, uh, input. Others will have input. Let me turn now to some additional um, measures that IOM is taking as an institution to try to really help create as inclusive and balanced and comprehensive a global compact as we can. Um, and these are not specifically called for in the modalities resolution, but are well in train at this point. We have asked um, our, all of our chiefs of mission and heads of offices. We have about um, we have offices in more than 150 countries worldwide. We've asked each of the heads of our offices to go to their host governments and suggest that they convene national multi-stakeholder consultations that would bring in all the relevant ministries and government who work on aspects, um, who have responsibilities that touch on migration issues. So not just one ministry, but really a host of them. And we specifically ask that they bring in non-governmental stakeholders, civil society organizations, migrant and diaspora groups, academia, um, private sector, and others. And so far, we've had positive replies from more than 50 countries, and we will be looking at help support national consultations, which will then provide avenues into expressing views. Second, in addition to the regional consultations that I mentioned already, um, we're hoping to have two more sets of regional consultations. One through what are called the regional consultative processes of migration, and there's 18 to 20 of those that exist, depending on how you count, around the world. These are government-led um, existing fora that are specifically focused on migration 
some of them take up child's rights issues, particularly in the Americas, but not exclusively. And those are additional um, avenues for, for um, intervention. The, third, the second additional regional um, consultative mechanism that we hope to put in place relates to something else I want to see, which is that we have um, decided to bring on a dedicated civil society liaison uh, person, consultant, who to work with us to help feed information, ideas, um, recommendations in both directions, to both into IOM as we work and back out to civil society networks um, as we move forward. And I'm delighted to say that we've brought on Colin Raja, formerly the head of the Global Coalition on Migration, and he was most recently the chair of the GFMD Civil Society Days um, last year in Dhaka, and, and a very long history on advocacy on, on migrants' rights and uh, migrant protection and, and the whole host. He has proposed, and we have fully supported, the idea of having regional civil society consultations in advance of each of the planned regional consultations. And that would give another venue for canvassing ideas and bringing up um, different stakeholders, including child's rights advocates at the regional level. The third additional activity that I wanted to mention is IOM's Director General decided to dedicate IOM's annual policy forum, which is the uh, International Dialogue on Migration, um, to the Global Compact on Migration this year. And in, to carry that out, we'll be holding two um, separate meetings. The first one will actually be in New York on the 18th and 19th of April, and that will focus on uh, and oh, it's usually Millie whose dog is barking. It's nice that it's not mine this time. <laughs> Strengthening cooperation and governance on migration at all of the levels because we felt it was important before getting into the individual thematic consultations to have an overview about objectives for this uh, for the global compact. Very much in line with what Ignacio said before about grounding it in not only in the existing normative frameworks but also in the sustainable development goals with a focus on how to actually translate existing commitments into concrete um, tangible action on behalf of migrants of all sorts. The second of our international dialogue on migration meetings will take place in July in Geneva and will focus on protection and assistance um, for migrants in vulnerable situations. And we've already had a request from the initiative, one that we welcome most wholeheartedly, to dedicate one session of that um, two-day meeting specifically to children and to the vulnerabilities that children can face in the migration process. And um, we're really hoping that that, I'm, I'm confident that that will come forward and be a good opportunity um, for engagement. The last regional, um, regional effort that I wanted to mention is that we are also holding a global meeting of those regional consultative processes on migration that will take place here in Geneva in October to bring together the chairs and the secretariats of all of those. And the final additional IOM effort that I wanted to mention is we have launched a migration research leaders syndicate um, with 30 to 40 prominent migration researchers from around the world from different geographical regions and different thematic focus to um, really try to pull some of the best evidence, best thinking, and uh, I'm happy to say that Jackie Baba is one of uh, those researchers, and we're delighted that she has agreed to contribute. We're in the process of, we're about to launch this week, um, a web page that will include the list of the participants in the Migration Research Leaders Syndicate, including the, um, what they see as some of the most important um, documents, um, analysis that they would want policymakers to look at for the Global Compact to help bolster the evidence base. And then we'll be commissioning some papers. But Jackie, uh, thank you for agreeing to do this. And I think that will help us ensure that we create a focus on children. So let me just wrap up by saying there's a lot of process now on the Global Compact on Migration. And I think it could get um, very overwhelming with all the various different meetings, all the various different stakeholders. 
And the message that I wanted to send to you is I think this initiative is doing exactly what you need to be doing to highlight um, the particular situation, the particular needs, the particular opportunities for children and ensuring a coherent agenda on children. And the idea of coming around five core principles that you would like to see realized across the two global compacts strikes me as a very wise way to ensure attention to this agenda. And my last point is that while the Global Compact on Migration and getting a good document is a very important aim, the process leading up to it and the process that follows it will be equally important. So the idea, Daniela, of what you said about organizing a coalition and really ensuring attention and something that will be lasting to keep a focus on child's rights, child's protection issues, really making that realizable over the long term. And I, I want to underline, I, I fully agree with uh, Ignacio's analysis about how the Global Compact on Migration should be framed and really looking at a, a realizable agenda that has firm commitments for now, but while recognizing that some things will, will take, take some time to realize effectively, I think that, that means that this group is already um, well-placed but, but needs to coalesce, stay together, stay focused on the core set of issues, and I think that will best um, result in, 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 in good outcomes for children in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. And we'll now turn over to um, Ellen Hansen of UNHCR. And so that we do have some time for questions, Ellen, um, uh, without uh, wanting to curtail what you're going to say, please do um, try to be quite concise. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so let me just outline a little bit what the process is on the um, Global Compact on Refugees side, uh, and I'll keep it fairly short. Um, as Michelle has said, it is, uh, it is quite a different process, and on the Global Compact on Refugees, UNHCR has been tasked by the General Assembly to, to lead and uh, initiate and develop um, comprehensive refugee response framework, which will form the basis of the Global Compact on Refugees. Um, now, we've recently, um, I hope you're all aware, uh, presented a roadmap of uh, how we take that work forward. And um, I'll just say that um, what, what we're planning to do is um, the Global Compact, the way we envisioned it, envision it at this point, is that it will be the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework pretty well as it stands, as it's been applied and tested um, in a number of pilot and case study countries. Uh, and there we've got to date Uganda, Somalia, <coughs> Ethiopia, United Republic of Tanzania, uh, and we've recently um, had uh, Honduras put themselves forward and we're looking at a, a number of other geographic regions. Um, but we're also going to have a number of uh, thematic discussions, um, but uh, I'll come back to that as well. Uh, so the Global Compact on Refugees, as we see it, will be the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework with some kind of preambular paragraphs uh, and some concluding paragraphs. Uh, the, the preambular paragraphs, and we'll be discussing and consulting uh, a range of, of partners and stakeholders on that, um, but we'll basically um, be kind of reaffirming the, the you know, refugee protection regime, etc. Uh, and the concluding paragraphs will pick up things that perhaps are not in the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework that we should be in, think should be in there. Now there'll be a complementary program of action, and I think this is where it's probably more interesting for all of you, um, because it picks up on a lot of the things that you've actually outlined. Um, <laughs> both in terms of the thematic areas, um, but also through uh, identifying key issues and exchanging good practices. Um, because we think that the program of action should really operationalize the comprehensive refugee response and commitments and actions that can be taken. And that is where we think that uh, we can all be a bit aspirational about what we would like to achieve. Um, and I like some of the comments about really, um, you know, trying to achieve some, some breakthroughs here. Um, it is a difficult context and environment, as Michelle said, um, and that goes, I think, for both refugees and for migrants. 
Um, so I think we need to be aspirational, but I think you know we may also uh, see some of those aspirations not come to full fruition, um, as we did in fact in the New York Declaration. There are a number of uh, things that were a little bit disappointed, but never disappointing. But nevertheless, overall, we were very happy with the outcome, which we think provides a very good uh, basis. We're quite keen not to reopen the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework. Um, because we think that um, there will be different interests at stake, and we did get agreement by 193 UN member states around what's in there, so we think we should build on that. Now, in our roadmap, taking forward, we will have a number of thematic sessions. We look, that we're going to have thematic sessions this year, and I have to say, you know, we've also been inspired by some of the. We're going a little bit in parallel with what's happening on the other the, the side of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. Um, but our themes will really be based, uh, the thematic discussions will be based around the four pillars set out in the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework. So it's reception and admission, support for immediate and ongoing needs, support for host countries and communities, uh, and durable solutions. Um, now, children are not mentioned uh, very um, explicitly in anything other than the first two thematic uh, pillars there. Um, but I think, like all of you, uh, we're very keen to ensure that uh, children's rights are really fully reflected, well, in both compacts, really, um, and really that it is the, the children first kind of perspective that we bring to those global compacts. Um, we will also do some stock taking. Um, we're going to do that at the High Commissioner's Dialogue on Protection Challenges, which some of you may know is a kind of fairly dynamic um, dialogue that is, is not the usual United Nations formal member state uh, statements. And then, you know, a little bit of space for NGOs at the end. We try to mix it up a lot more. Uh, that will also build on the NGO consultations, uh, which are taking place. Um, 14 to 16 June, uh, right after your uh, conference. Um, so, with a bit of luck, we can one can inform the other, and we can really, you know, build the momentum there as well. Um, and um, uh, finally, the formal consultations will take place in February to July 2018. Now, strictly speaking, the High Commissioner can put forward uh, whatever he likes in his report to the General Assembly, uh, which is put to bed in August 2018 and which will be considered at the General Assembly in um, October, November 2018. Um, but what we're hoping is that we will get a kind of a consensus text on the um, program of action. So that you know, in Geneva, we can really forge ahead with something that has very strong buy-in from all stakeholders, uh, member states, civil society, other international organisations, um, and then that can then be put forward. The formal mechanism for adoption of the Global Compact on Refugees is in the annual General Assembly resolution. Um, now, we haven't worked out the exact mechanics, and that's really in the hands of the member states who negotiate that omnibus resolution, as it's known. Uh, in 2018, it will be Sweden uh, that's facilitating that process. Um, but what we hope is to have a, an operative paragraph which really gets member states sign off on what we've put forward, what the High Commissioner has put forward. Um, but look, I realize that um, we don't have much time, so I'll leave it there. And thank you very much for inviting us to, to join. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, I think we have received a lot of insight and um, openness from uh, both you um, and Michelle about what this process is going to look like and, um, and various points at which advocates can engage. Uh, I'm going to launch the um, second to last poll while I also bring the first round of questions that have come through to the panelists. So I'm launching the question for the participants here. It is, how do you think the Global Compacts could best contribute to enhancing the protection and support of children on the move. Uh, the five options are by including SDG-like targets and indicators on child rights, uh, by including a system of coordination at the national, regional, and international level, 
by reiterating general principles on child rights, uh, by providing operational guidance to responding to large-scale movement involving children, uh, or do not know. While you complete that poll, which should be open for you, we already have five questions that have come in from the audience members, and please do um, use the questions box to send more. Uh, the first one, which came in by email before the webinar began is from Dr. Donald Wortlieb. Um, and it's a complicated one. Um, at this early point in the process of articulating principles and action plans, there is only cursory awareness and commitment to the special needs and rights of young children with disabilities and their families. Much is still only lip service and uninformed, such as listening, quote unquote, disabilities as a vulnerability, noting a commitment to early childhood education. It is essential that the power and promise of early childhood development, uh, especially its inclusive and cross-sectoral forms where we connect the dots between the Convention on the Rights of the Child and Child Rights Protection and Development, be advanced as key elements of diverse solutions to the crisis. Um, all of that is background to the questions, which are, are there any efforts underway to address this set of concerns? Uh, and do you have examples of a program or a country that is doing good work in this area? So that's a very um, programmatic question. Aline Rabani, and my apologies to participants uh, whose names I mispronounce in advance, uh, while um, Michelle was speaking, Aline asked if the information about the various uh, processes was available anywhere online, uh, especially dates and places where consultative meetings are happening. Um, Eleanor Milburn asks how uh, we, being advocates, I suspect, can join the consultation with Colin Raha. I hope I'm pronouncing both names correctly. Uh, Najit Karmacharya uh, has asked, has indicated that uh, they are eager to understand how the global compacts will include national level contexts, uh, which is something that um, several people referred to. And finally, as um, Ellen was speaking, Freha Ibsen asked, where can we find the roadmap? Um, so maybe if we could have uh, the presenters in the same order um, that they presented, uh, that being Daniela, then Ignacio, um, followed by Michelle and um, Ellen answering those questions. And I'm just sharing the poll results here. Um, a plurality. I'm getting a note that people cannot hear me anymore. I hope they can. Um, a plurality including SDG-like targets and indicators at 42%, and then in the 20% for coordination systems and operational guidance. But very few people saying that reiterating general principles uh, is the way to go. Um, so over to Daniela, Ignacio, Michelle, and Ellen. And please do send more questions as they come. Thanks, Mark. I wonder whether many of these questions are very much um, better directed to our um, colleagues, Michelle and Ellen, as they re define um, reference much more to the steps ahead on the global comp compacts. But uh, I would say just uh, from my side that I, I do agree that um, both issues around disability and early childhood development are key um, parts of, the, of um, and should be key parts of our reflection and our, and our action. Um, just to add that, for example, um, Part of our uh, steering group on, um, for the initiative also includes actors that work on uh, um, early childhood de development and, uh, and does include all, obviously all organizations like us that uh, um, work on around issues of um, disability. So um, we will bring it forward for surely. Um, and um, and I will probably leave in the interest of time others to reply to questions more related to the compacts themselves. A good my go, Mark. Is that right? Hello. 
Yes, Ignacio, please go ahead. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, perhaps um, some inputs on the on the national um, level and linked to the the initiative. Um, we we do expect this initiative to have um, a, a wider impact than just on the global um, uh, compacts because it it should, if we get it right, influence also the way in which first all children on the move are protected and um, and supported, and also that it should serve beyond um, the advocacy and lobbying work on the global compacts. It can serve also at national uh, level to develop also, for instance, civil society organizations in uh, targeting in a very concrete, concrete way what they should be lobbying with uh, the uh, different stakeholders in their, uh, in their country. And um, uh, just to give an example, this the Destination Unknown uh, campaign, which is on the protection of children on the move, about 100 organizations, is moving its next phase um, um, greatly to, to resource a bit more capacity building also at, at national uh, level. So the, all this is, is not unlinked to the, uh, the efforts at, uh, at national, at national le level. And then there was, I think, if I understood correctly, one question on what, what could this look like in a very concrete way. And, and um, in, in, in terms of um, uh, indicators and targets, for instance, one that comes often in the discussions around ed access to education for all children is that uh, when a child moves into a new context, uh, crossing borders or inter uh, internally displaced, he should be, ha be able to have access to quality education within four weeks. That's something which is concrete, which can be also measured, but we also have to give um, uh, uh, and also work on this at national level and really link, linking the national and the global level. Hopefully the global level is going to really going to give uh, a strong push with these two global compacts on which the uh, civil society is also in national level and other stakeholders can push in, in, uh, in making, uh, making a change. And of course while we um, are putting resources as civil society organizations on this is because we believe that this offers uh, in key, it's a generation, it, it won't happen twice in our generation and it is the moment to, be, to put the effort and the energy to try and influence and get something as tangible as possible around these two global compacts and at the same time not neglect the urgency of us as civil society organizations of continuing on a daily basis to uh, try and respond to uh, needs of uh, uh, the most vulnerable affected by uh, different crises. Ignacio, if I can jump in here, we uh, have only have seven more minutes with um, Ellen from UNHCR, so I was hoping to turn the microphone to her for a few minutes um, before we hear from Michelle at IOM. Um, yeah, thank you very much. That's much appreciated. Look, I, I won't say a lot. Uh, we do have a, a website which you can get if you just Google New York Declaration um, for Refugees and Migrants, um, and it has information about the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework, uh, as well as a number of um, you know speeches and tools, etc. Um, we're we're revising the roadmap in line with comments that we received, uh, but that will be online uh, with a calendar. I would say within a week. Um, but uh, we also have a document, uh, a one-pager on the roadmap, which uh, we can share after this meeting. Just coming very quickly to national level contacts, we're very conscious of that, and we're also conscious of the need for inclusion, which is one of the main uh, kind of uh, important uh, underlying principles of the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework. Finally, on the question of um, paying more attention to uh, persons with disabilities, I would just say that we're establishing a uh, youth advisory board which consists of refugee youth um, and one of those will be a refugee youth with disability uh, and that person will be feeding into all of these processes. Um, just also we've got a special segment at our NGO consultations uh, during the thematic session on reception and admission where we're working very closely with Handicap International 
uh, to ensure that um, disability persons with disabilities are fully included there. So, um, you know, uh, I'll just leave it there. But we're very, very conscious of the importance of this and, and taking that work forward. Uh, and thank you very much for including us. And we would be very happy to engage further. And we will be sending some materials uh, to you after this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen. And could you just repeat the website one more time? It's unhcr.org.org slash New York Declaration. Slash New York Declaration. Wonderful. Um, and any documents that you get to us, we can share with all of the registered participants, both those who made it in the door um, up to the limit and those who simply registered as well. So thank you very much for Look, your time. Look, and we're very, today. very happy to uh, very happy to pitch in if the, this is an additional session for those who didn't make it. Um, really appreciate this opportunity and really uh, very much um, you know, appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you, Ellen. Michelle, if we could hear from you, and then we have two last questions that I would like to bring back to the group. Sure. Thank you very much, and I'll be brief. While you're all taking notes on websites, let me give you the, the uh, dedicated IOM website for the Global Compact on Migration. It will be launched this Friday. It's www.iom.int backslash global hyphen compact hyphen migration. You can get there the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants and the Modalities Resolution that lays out much of what I said. And then we'll also include the dates, the locations, et cetera, of um, the, uh, the specific consultations I mentioned. We will, we will also provide um, a link to how to engage with the civil society-oriented consultations and work there, um, including with context uh, for Colin Raja. And I, I do want to underscore what the others have said about the importance of national level context and really working to improve governance um, at the national level. This has to, this global effort needs to translate down into national laws, policies, and practices. And that's really where the change will 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 matter and and, and be sustainable. So well, many of the discussions, the negotiations will be at the regional and global level. At the national level is where it will make a difference about what um, actually goes into effect. So that, and, and the differences in national level context absolutely need to be taken into consideration as well as differences in regional context. Um, and migration certainly takes place in different ways in different parts of the world. And we need to be cognizant of those differences while having a common set of principles and commitments across the board. Let, let me stop there since I, I, I know there's, uh, we're short of time and happy to come back if there are further questions. There are two more uh, questions. One is quite along the same lines as one of the recent questions, but adding another dimension. And Sophie Lois is asking, how can we ensure that inclusion, which we've heard some about, and gender dimensions be considered and integrated in the two compacts, which I think is an excellent question for um, all of the remain, remaining panelists and the, the audience at large. And Okello Moses Arnold has said this, significant is work, work is needed on the implementation and the mobilization of additional support for the comprehensive uh, refugee framework. How will the compact ensure that this is enhanced? And unfortunately, Ellen is no longer with us, but I know that the others on the um, call have some additional thoughts on that as well. Um, shall we do Daniela, Ignacio, and Michelle again in that order? Sure. Um, thanks, Mark. Uh, firstly, um, from uh, from civil society's perspective, and um, addressing the the latter, the second question that you have mentioned, um, we we will work very very closely as much as possible um, in the areas, in the countries where the um, comprehensive framework is being piloted uh, to ensure that, you know, the, the appropriate resources are in place and we'll definitely uh, work with um, um, WNHCR and, uh, and also um, at country level um, to, in, to ensure that a 
a truly comprehensive framework is put in place with the support of uh, all stakeholders, so um, civil society um, being um, a key element of, uh, uh, of its success. So um, our, um, our advocacy, if you like, will be directed towards ensuring that there is enough um, <laughs> resources and enough uh, to, to, um, to support the framework and to translate that into a, a operationable um, global compact. Um, the initiative itself, which includes obviously a much larger um, <coughs> range of stakeholders, um, we see that um, its, its role in ensuring that um, in advocating for those resources to be in place will be quite um, uh, crucial will be the crux of, uh, of what we will be very much working um, cooperatively on and we hope that also the the message that will come from the conference will will go towards that very um, very direction um, on the issues around gender I, I agree that um, this uh, obviously this is something that uh, um, it's very well spelled out in the New York Declaration, and uh, um, we'll we'll be advocating for a focus on, from our perspective, focus on girls um, and a gender dimension as well of um, um, reflected in the compacts. Um, so these are part of our advocacy agenda, if you like. Um, I will leave it to maybe Michelle to also talk about how. Um, I am seeing these issues um, being included in the compact itself. Sure. Um, Ignacio, do you want to go now or, or is it okay for, to jump in? No. I, I, I go after you, Michelle. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think it's, it's essential on, on both points, certainly on the Global Migration Compact, to ensure inclusion and inclusion of gender-related dimensions, both in terms of particular vulnerabilities, but also um, capacities um, that migration affords for gender empowerment and for women to ha and, and girls to have opportunities that they may not otherwise have. Um, and, and you know, not to simply reduce gender issues to that, but those are those are key key issues and components. I think we need to, in a similar way to this coalition organizing along around child's rights, child's protection, it would be helpful to do um, a similar organization around gender related issues. There is a specific reference in the New York Declaration and in the modalities resolution to ensure ensuring. Um, gender responsive and gender sensitive policies and, and, and programs. I'm not sure what the precise language is. But I think we need to do more to turn that half of the sentence into something meaningful. I know that we are certainly in our work as IOM making sure that we um, include, integrate mainstream gender related issues across the board. But it may be beneficial to um, foster a, um, a coalition around those issues as well. And UN Women, um, uh, including through its work in the Global Migration Group, has put together a good brief on the gender-related aspects and uh, that many agencies have signed on to. And I think that could start as a good um, advocacy tool, but we, we need to create a constituency that's, that's organized around that. And on the the, the financial and, and um, other ongoing support for implementation is equally important for the, the Migration Compact. And at this point, there's not a specific mechanism, although there have been two interesting proposals that I suspect will get more attention over the coming months. One, in the modalities resolution for the Global Compact on Migration, there's reference to creation of a voluntary trust fund that um, is for the preparation uh, process of the Global Compact, but I think could potentially serve as a useful precedent going forward about its effective implementation. And secondly, Special Representative the Secretary General on Migration, Peter Sutherland, whose term is coming to an end, um, recently released a report um, on, really with recommendations on the future of migration governance. It's a very thoughtful report with quite a few specific recommendations that are worth um, taking into consideration, but one of them is to create a dedicated financing facility on migration-related capacity building 
not only for states but also for civil society and um, international and other organizations. And I think we really do need to see over the coming years more effective, longer-term, sustainable focus on capacity building for protection of migrants. And uh, it's long overdue. Thank you. Just a, a quick input um, from me on the second question. Uh, Mark, OK? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I make it super short. It's uh, uh, So on the second question, which was more around resource, well, that's the key issue. It's around resources. It's about leadership. It's about action. And resources and action should not fall into the non-binding in any way of the global impact. <laughs> it's about um, sharing responsibilities. It is also for civil society to realize that these are not Geneva, New York discussions. This is in capitals. And we have to be better equipped to, as civil society to work in, in, in capitals, to work at national level. And this is uh, uh, the, the, the tool through the initiative, um, in, including the, the working document, including uh, hopefully in the third uh, pillar of this initiative, capacity building and support, is also to, uh, to be working more at, uh, at capital level. Thank you so much for those thoughts, Ignacio. Um, and to everybody, I um, have been in discussions with you all presenting over the past several weeks and um, still feel like I was on a steep learning curve today and um, feel like we are at the beginning of an important process or in the middle of an important process and I'm so um, appreciative to have this opportunity to learn how we can engage. Uh, before we sign off here, I'm launching our final uh, poll. How did you feel about the webinar? Um, those of you who are um, who made it in the door, and I think we will make sure that uh, we increase our hosting capacity for the next one because we we didn't break the internet, but um, you broke our webinar hosting capacity. <laughs> um, a few other things I wanted to draw your attention to is that there are some handouts that you can download directly through um, the handout uh, through the webinar itself. But uh, we will be sending out an email, a follow-up email, to all registrants, not just those who actually became participants, um, in the in 24 hours, and that will include a recording of the webinar from beginning to end for those who are let in the door a little bit late. It will also include a web page where all of the documents and any new ones that we receive from UNHCR and others are uploaded. Um, also, all registrants will automatically be invited to join our next webinar in May, which will be uh, presenting some of the thinking around how children can be included in both global compacts and soliciting your input on that. Um, I'm going to, um, we've got 59% voting. Would anyone else like to vote? And otherwise, I'm going to close in five, four, three, two, closed. Uh, sharing this, we had a 60% satisfaction rate and 22% very satisfied. But about one in six of you were neither satisfied nor dissatisfied. So please do send feedback on uh, specific elements uh, that you would like to see improved. Thank you all for joining. Um, and we will be sh circulating these materials um, momentarily. Uh, big thanks to Daniela Reale of Save the Children, Ignacio Packer of Terre des Hommes, Michelle Klein-Solomon of um, the International Organization for Migration, and um, Ellen Hansen of the UNHCR. A good rest of the morning, afternoon, or evening to you wherever this finds you in the world. And we look forward to hearing from you again about how we can improve our efforts uh, to make sure that these global compacts, a once in a generation opportunity, are truly inclusive of all children and families in the world. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. And Thank all. you, Mark. Thank you, everyone.